Hello and welcome to another episode of the Speak the Truth podcast. I am your host, Matt Tardio. You can find me over on Instagram at AngerTab, A-N-G-E-R-T-A-B. If you want to see some of my cringy life photos, you're more than welcome to go over there and check them out. I'm going to open this up with a uh, statement that somebody, or a comment, if you will, that one of the uh, subscribers posted um, on the last video. And her name is Marisa... I'm hoping I'm getting this right, Alonzo. And she said, I have family in my home from Zaporizhia. Their homes are right near the nuclear power plant. We have family from up and down the Dnieper and the coastal cities like Mariupol. Sometimes we can talk to them. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes they have food, sometimes electricity, many times not. When we talk to them, we find out details from the occupied areas. Just FYI, the Russians tortured the priest in their village. It's all true. We are exhausted with the weekly reports from family members. We cry weekly. This channel is important to me because it is created by fellow veterans, feels a responsibility to report the truth, good and or bad. I don't want to hear false hope. I so appreciate the numbers and statistics. It's a great service to us already inundated with reports from family not to have to look at 20 different channels and looking at videos over and over again. Thank you for concise reporting. I've been watching since almost day one. So Marissa, thank you very much for making that comment. Um, to the idiot that responded back to her and was like, your last name is Alonzo. There's no way you can be Ukrainian. You're an idiot, sir. Whoever you are, you're stupid. I'm just going to throw that out there. Now, I'm probably going to have to edit that out because that's bullying. Well, either way. Yeah, we do try to stick to the facts, whether or not people like them or hate them. And I have some facts that I don't think a lot of people are going to like today. Well, some of them are facts and some of them are assumptions. And on the last video, I did make some assumptions saying that the United States is having issues sending out ammunition supplies over to Ukraine. And after we made that video, there was um, a slip up that got reported to me that Biden had in the media where he had accidentally said, um, you know, a reporter had asked him as he was walking past, why are you, well, here, here's the video. Why now? Run out of ammunition. Biden flat out admits in that video, or it would seem, that U Ukraine's running out of ammunition, so we got to do something. We got some clutch munitions. But then I did a little bit more deeper research, and I found this. Uh, this video looks like from a CNN interview, um, and Biden straight up admits that we're running out here in America. Well, America is not running out, but what we can provide to them is running out. Here it is. Biden seemed to reveal the U.S. is also running low. Take a listen. They're running out of those that ammunition, and we're low on it. And so what I finally did, took the recommendation of the Defense Department to not permanently, but to allow for in this transition period where we get more 155 weapons, these shells for the Ukrainians to provide them with a something that has a very low dud rate and it's not used in civilian areas they're trying to get through those trenches and those then stop those tanks from rolling and so uh but it was not an easy decision so in that video what you actually hear him telling um is they want to use those cluster munitions to clear and move through trenches now, I said in the last video that it takes a lot of artillery to support offensive operations in this type of warfare, that you need to have some sort of shaping operations that go into place. And these Russians are pretty dang well dug in on these front lines. The Ukrainians are meeting a lot of resistance as they go up. They're meeting resistance by minefields. They're meeting resistance by trenches and small arms fire. They're meeting resistance by artillery. They're meeting lots of resistance. And unfortunately, as good as reconnaissance and everything is, um, some of you all had commented that, hey, look, Russia is going to need to send artillery uh, in mass because they don't have the ability to precisely, you know, pick them out. So, of course, they're going to send up mass amounts of artillery rounds in order to, you know, try to kill the Ukrainians. And on the flip side, Ukrainian, of course, they're shooting less because they have more precise artillery rounds than they're able to get on. Well, unfortunately, that's just not how warfare works. It works that way sometimes, but not all the time. When you have a force that's advancing forward through minefields, through fences, through trenches, you need to have some sort of covering fire down on the ground in front of them. And that's what Ukraine needs this ammunition for is basically essentially for the covering fire to allow that breathing room for them to clear those minefields and to actually reach the Russian lines in order to like to, to liberate them. There's no other way to go about it. So they need the artillery to get in there. They either need that or they need fast movers. They need bombers. They need things like that. But that, that's a ways out. 
you know, we're not even talking now we're talking August before it was July. Now it's August for the training for uh, the Ukrainian fighter pilots for the F-16. So they're not even going to be in service for a while. So they need this ammunition right away. And Biden flat out admitted that we need to provide them with artillery shells. We are not producing enough and we um, are going to be sending these. Now, the artillery being provided to Ukraine was in stipulation, right? Like they're saying that they're not going to use it in occupied areas, okay, or in civilian occupied areas, excuse me. They're not going to use it in civilian occupied areas. And they're going to ramp up their efforts for demining afterwards to make sure that all the UXO is gone. The problem is, is that all sounds fine and dandy, but I really don't think there's any way for the US or NATO to guarantee and check until reports start coming out if they did accidentally use them on occupied areas or did purposefully use them on occupied areas. So we'll have to wait for that to come out. As far as demining goes, there's so much UXO, unexploded Nordids, that's scattered all across Ukraine now. They are going to have a massive demining effort regardless, whether or not they use the cluster munitions or not. The amount of Russian mines and Ukrainian mines that are just laid across that battlefield is absolutely insane. And I really wish that my buddy Ryan was able to come on today. And unfortunately, we had some technical issues and we're not able to get him on today, but we will get him on here in the near future. Um, I believe in everything that Ryan's doing. He's over in Ukraine. He goes to Ukraine routinely and rips out landmines for humanitarian reasons. Um, and it's just an amazing thing. Ryan's a retired Green Beret. Solid dude. Awesome friend. Love him to death. So if you want to see more on him, you can go check out Tip of the Spear landmine removal. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to stick to some of these stories from Ukraine. So not that much has been going on on the front lines. There's been little gains made here and there. And it's truthfully, to put it up on a map is a waste of time. There's just little minute gains. Bakhmut still hasn't fallen to the Ukrainians yet. They're still working on in circling the entire city. They, they haven't got there yet. There's been little advances made in Zaporizhia over the last week. Okay. Um, as far as down in the Kyrgyzstan area, not very little movement whatsoever. It looks like Russians may have gone forward and possibly secured a bridge um, somewhere in the gray area. But all of it's unconfirmed. N- no real information or intel to give out as far as that goes. With that being said, Ukraine has decided, the Ukraine uh, Defense Ministry has decided to put out a video of a what they're calling the Ukrainian Navy SEALs that assaulted an island off the Dnipro River. So they, we're going to watch this video and we're going to talk about it as it, as it kind of goes, goes along because um, there is some pretty interesting things in this video. All right, so what you're looking at is an assault going towards an island in the middle of the Dnipro River, uh, reportedly in the Kyrgyzstan region. Um, Ukrainians flew a drone up over the island and saw a couple of Russians that were running away, and the drone started to get some video feedback problems, and so they assumed it was some counter UAB type stuff, and they decided to go launch an assault. They sent what is nicknamed as Ukrainian Navy SEALs after them, and you can see them approaching the island in two rib boats mounted with 50 cal machine guns um, as they go up. They get within probably about 100 meters of the island before they actually open fire, which is about to take place here, and they just start hammering that thing. And, you know, I'd love to call this an assault, but really what it kind of reminds me of, um, if you're from America, is a drive-by shooting. Um, They pull up to the island and just start blasting that sucker and just start hammering and laying into it. Just 50 cal rounds after 50 cal rounds machine guns. You can just see pouring through that place um, as they're ripping that island apart. They finish up by driving by this island. They get to the other side and they keep going. There's a little exchange of artillery fire and reportedly a couple Russians are killed at the end of the day. So this strikes a question in Matt's brain. And that question is with all of the offensive operations that are currently taking place, how is this the best video that Ukraine has moving forward. You know, what I would expect to see propaganda wise coming out of Ukraine with the offensive operations taking place is pictures of captured Russian soldiers or pictures of cities that they have taken. And we're not really getting that much from them as far as the front line goes. As a matter of fact, um, one of the videos that got sent to me by a friend happens to be a Ukrainian soldier that got captured up by the um, I'm, 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 it's not reported, excuse me, it's not reported where it came from, but it's a Ukrainian soldier that's been captured. Um, it appears that he stepped on a couple landmines. We're going to play this video for you right now so that you can kind of get a view of what they're dealing with. Um, and I'll go ahead and narrate along. So this guy, when you look at his face right off the bat, um, and we start talking about this, he's got 
obvious signs of facial trauma, right? At the same time, those, those little pellet wounds that you kind of see on his face, that's all probably from shrap metal. Okay, so you can see where his lips ripped up and on the side, everything else. That's all from shrap metal that comes in place. So the guy even admits in this video that he ended up stepping on a mine when he ended up getting captured. And I'm going to stop the video right there. What he ends up saying is that he was a, a conscript out of the Sumi region, and they um, essentially took him, gave him a little bit of training. Um, he gave up a training location in the Donetsk region. Uh, he gave up a training location at some place where he was stationed, and then they put him on the front line for about a month. And he's been there with about 10 other Ukrainian soldiers, just kind of butts flapping in the wind until Russia finally assaulted and captured him. I don't know how he's been on the front line, but flapping in the wind with 10 guys. And this is where I look and I go propaganda question mark, maybe question mark. But um, if he was stepping on a landmine, that means he was moving forward through Russian areas, or maybe he just haphazardly came across one and got one. And then all the other guys kind of like left him out there. But either way, the guy ends up getting captured. The purpose of this video is propaganda, right? So Russia's propaganda going into this is Russia is saying that, look, we treated you well. You got captured. We treated your legs. We gave you water. And you can see in this video that he's flex cuffed and that there is some wrapping around his leg. And the guy is saying and agreeing with a lot of the stuff the Russian soldiers are asking about him. He's asking him if he's asking him if he'd been beat. He's asking him, have you been mistreated? He's asking him questions like that. And the Ukrainians like, no, I was treated really well. Um, you guys are taking care of me. And the Russians like, yeah, we're going to fly you back to Russia, whatever. Moral of the story here is we don't know what happened the moment that camera got turned off. While that video is going on, you can still hear gunshots and explosions going on in the background. So it looks like we're talking within minutes of this guy being captured, definitely within the hour of this guy being captured and treated by the Russians. They decide to whip out their phone and get like a quick propaganda video before anything bad happens to the guy. Now that's Matt's take on it. I think after the video shut off, they probably went back to the regular way of treating soldiers. But hey, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe Russia is turning in aloof, but I highly, highly doubt it. But Russia is on the forefront. They understand that they're looking bad in the eyes of the international community. And it kind of makes me wonder if they're not putting out information to their soldiers to start collecting some like this to make it seem like they're, they're better than they really are. I just showed you in like a video the other day of a torture chamber out of Zaporizhia, all right, or a reported torture chamber out of Zaporizhia. And then, you know, Russia's out putting videos like this. And while we're at it, we might as well talk about Russian troops being high on methamphetamine. That's right. Russia reportedly, all right, coming from Ukrainian soldiers is issuing their conscripts out of the DPR and LPR liquid meth. And they're giving these soldiers liquid meth before they push them out in a battle and treat them as cannon fodder. What they're saying is that they're giving these soldiers the liquid meth and sending them forward to the front lines in order to basically soak up all the artillery and mortar rounds that's coming in before they put the actual soldiers through. It's freaking mind numbing that they're still doing this. And it's funny to me because you know who invented that technique was <laughs> the Nazis. The Nazis did that. And what's Russia complain about? Nazis in Ukraine. But hey, yeah, why not? If it works, it works. So they're giving them meth. I know, truthfully, there's a couple times in my military career I wish I would have had meth or something to keep my awake on. Wagner. Wagner returning to Ukraine. Where is Prigozhin? Everybody wants to know where Prigozhin's at. Well, it looks like for a little bit there was a story floating around the internet about Wagner returning to Ukraine in the next couple weeks. That's right. On August 5th, it's reported that Wagner is going to return into Ukraine. But wait, it's false. That video that has been floating around the internet, if you've seen it, of Progrosian talking, saying that they're going to take a break and then they're going to return on August 5th, that video was actually filmed before the attempted coup that he launched. In the video, actually, I want to say it was on June 13th, all right, it was a separate interview, so this was uh, that, that video of Progrosian floating around talking about going back on August 5th. Um, that was filmed the same day as a separate interview that got posted on June 13th. So prior to the coup taking place. So that was Prigozhin talking about things way before the coup took place. So he is not going to be returning. Um, again, it just goes to show you how hard you have to actually dig to make sure that you're reporting accurate information. Nobody knows where Prigozhin's currently at. Um, nobody knows what's up with him. Nobody, nobody knows kind of the future of him or of a lot of the 
the the guys, I guess, that were under his control that took part in that coup would can't wait to find out what's going to happen to him. All right, so there you have it. There is your war update for the day. Not too much going on in Ukraine, and I think with the new arrival of these artillery shells, we should see operations increasing once they make their way up to the front line. Hopefully, Ukraine puts them to good use, um, uses them appropriately, and we get um, good results, and Ukraine starts taking some terrain now that they got the artillery that they require. And I'm not The United States has used cluster munitions in Iraq and Afghanistan just as recent as Iraq and Afghanistan. We use cluster munitions. So who the hell are we to sit back and judge? It's kind of funny. Um, Anyways, thanks for stopping by another episode of the Speak the Truth podcast. I will see you guys again on Monday. I'm out.